Emergent doctrine, another one is substitutionary atonement is rejected. McLaren says this concerning the substitutionary atonement, that it sounds like one more injustice in the cosmic equation. It sounds like divine child abuse, you know. His point is, you wouldn't torture your son. That'd be child abuse, right? And so if God has poured down his wrath on his own son, which he did for our salvation, the propitiation uh, of God, and satisfaction of God's wrath and, and our and need for our sin being placed on him. If God did that to his own son, you know what that is? That is divine child abuse. Can't be true, he said. It, this, the atonement cannot be true. Well, you got somebody in your own islands that says the same thing. The fact is the cross isn't a form of cosmic child abuse. A vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he didn't even commit. Uh, this individual is saying, look, um, the, the atonement can't be right. The cross cannot be right. God would never punish his son for something he did not do. That's Steve Chalk, who is here on your uh, stations, I understand, and quite prominent in the islands here. He has a couple more statements that we'll read to you. In my view, the real problem with penal substitution, or uh, the same thing we're talking about here, substitutionary atonement, is that it is wholly incompatible with any Christian understanding of the character of God. Given, for instance, Jesus' own nonviolent, do not return evil for evil approach to life. It just isn't consistent with what we know about God. God wouldn't do this type of thing. God would not behave this way. So surely, surely, he did not send his own son to the cross and pour down his wrath on his own son. He would not have done that. One more by Chalk. He says, the Bible never defines God as anger, power, or judgment. In fact, it never defines him as anything other than love. Do you wonder what Bible these guys are reading? My Bible talks much about God's wrath and judgment. Matter of fact, according to Romans 1.18, we're, if we're unbeliever, we're already under his wrath. But more than that, it never makes assertions about his anger, power, or judgment independent of his love. What the emergent church people have done is, is, is wrap the whole of the message of the of scriptures around one statement that God is love. God is love and nothing else matters. His holiness doesn't matter. His judgment doesn't matter. Nothing matters about that one statement. They have distorted God's truth. They have an inclusive salvation. Here, here's basically how they, how they define salvation. McLaren says maybe God's plan is an opt-out plan. Maybe not an opt-in one. If you want to stay out of the party, you can. Here's his view. Everybody in the world is saved. Every Buddhist, every Hindu, every Mormon, every Jew, every whatever is saved. Unless they don't want to be saved. And if you want out of the party, he says, you can do that. He said, I can't imagine why anybody would. But if you want to opt out, if you want to jump out of the party, God will let you because God's a gentleman. If, outside of that, everybody's saved. Also, they're very green. He says, is getting individual souls into heaven the focal point of the gospel? I'd have to say no. It is the redemption of the world, the stars, the animals, the planets, the whole show. They're more concerned about the ozone layer than they are about human souls. Tony Coppola is another one that comes over here occasionally that teaches the same thing. So they're concerned about the salvation of the planet, uh, since everybody is already saved anyway, according to their view. A couple more thoughts here. The broad road. McLaren says, although I don't hope all Buddhists will become cultural Christians... I do hope all who feel so called will become Buddhist followers of Jesus. I believe they should be given that opportunity and invitation. I don't hope all Jews or Hindus will become members of the Christian religion, but I do hope all who feel so called will become Jewish or Hindu followers of Jesus. You can remain a Hindu or a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist and still be a Christian. Pretty broad. A couple more statements about their view of Scripture. What do they think about the Scriptures? McLaren writes this. A man named Paul is writing this, so is it his word or God's word? All right? And here he follows up. We retain Jesus as Savior, but promoted the Apostle Paul or someone else to Lord and teacher, and or decided that Jesus' life and teaching were completely interpreted by Paul. Now, some of you remember in the past where we, they pitted Jesus against Paul. The liberals in particular have done that for a long time where they've said, well, Paul really wasn't inspired, Jesus was, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And, and that's exactly what they're doing, and they're going even further. They're, in essence, they're saying the Scriptures are not inspired of the Holy Spirit. They're the words of men. Even the words of Jesus, by the way, according to these people, would be words that were made up by his followers, most of them. They wouldn't be things that Jesus actually said. 
At least we don't know they are. With the emergent church, then what are we left with? We have no truth. We have no doctrine. We have no gospel. What are we left with? Mystery. This is what they love, mystery. All these years, McLaren says, we have been chasing after orthodoxy. Those of us, most of us here probably have wanted to know truth. We want to know what God says. We want to know theology. He says when you stand before God someday, and you, you stand before Him all of His glory, and you look at Him, and you stand before Him, and here's what you're going to find out. As you stand in all this glory, that you understand nothing. In other words, all of your life, you chased after truth. And when you stand before God and see Him in His glory, you'll say, I didn't know anything. So why worry about it now? We're not going to know anything then. So why try to know something about truth now? Now, when, what we're left with then is this. Icon over here in Belfast. Uh, Peter Rowland says this. We at Icon are developing a theology which derives from the mystics, Catholic mystics mostly, a theology without theology to complement our religion without religion. In other words, they have no truth, they have no theology, they have nothing, they have no religion. And so we're going to have something. What are we going to do? Here's what they do. They come to a room like this, they dim the lights, they set candles around the room, they set up icons, and they burn their incense, and they have their prayer stations, and they feel God. They have a mystical experience in which they feel God. And this is what they want. They want to feel God. They want to have an experience. They have no truth. And so what they're left with is some kind of a supposed encounter with God in which they encounter Him and feel Him. My suggestion is they're not encountering God whatsoever. D.A. Carson, a theologian in the States, who's written a book on this subject, says, For almost everyone within the movement, this works out to an emphasis on feelings and affections, on experience over against truth. It's an experience-oriented program. We just come together and have an experience. Let's feel God, but we have no truth. Nor are we looking for truth because we don't believe there is any truth. These individuals then are trying to give this type of postmodern church, postmodern theology, to a postmodern age. They're offering them absolutely nothing that God wants to offer them. And yet they consider themselves evangelical Christians. And what they're left with is absolutely nothing. And yet I am deeply concerned that, that many, many are being deceived by this movement. And it is growing by leaps and bounds. So be aware of it. Be looking for it. And uh, may you be very discerning. May you know God's word so that you can see what's happening when it comes.